It's pretty obscure. Where the Japanese version of the slap fight. All right, guys, we're going to get started here. It's 10 o'clock, and uh, we're going to uh, kick off the event with the, uh, with the keynote speaker. So I want to welcome everyone to the second annual Tank Assembly 2018. Woo Those of you that don't know me, I'm Randy Kendig. I'm a member of the uh, Tank Assembly team. Uh, organizers, and uh, I, I do want to say that the, the group has been very uh, overwhelmed by the response to last year's show, and uh, everyone supported this year's show, from the exhibitors to the speakers to uh, the attendees uh, to the sponsors, and we appreciate everyone who has helped support this show. I want to thank you all very much for coming. Uh, we are very honored our, uh, to have a special a keynote speaker here. He has a long and distinguished career in the technology field. And uh, I'm going to just briefly run through Stuart Chappé's uh, bio here. It's hard to keep it short because he has a, a, such a long, distinguished career. Uh, he has been called, Stuart Chappé has been called the original TV techie and the dean of television computer journalists. He pioneered the field over 30 years ago, over 30 years ago, with his show, The Computer Chronicles, which I'm sure many of you know and uh, are familiar with. I remember watching that show back in the 80s and, and just loving the fact that there was a show about computers at that time. And always hoping that he would talk about my computer <laughs> show that, uh, that week, but um, it was a great show. He served as host and managing editor of Computer Chronicles. He anchored another public television show dedicated to the internet called Internet Ca or Net Cafe. Both series were broadcast nationally and throughout the world in over 100 countries for 20 years. His programs are still popular online, regularly downloaded, and viewed by fans all around the world. Stewart has been a guest commentator on National Public Radio's All Things Considered, has hosted a weekly web radio talk show called Talking About This Week. He wrote and co-anchored a syndicated radio series about the internet called Cyber Traffic Report. He's won numerous awards for his broadcast journalism work, including the CPA Award for Best Individual Technology Television Program of the Year, he was named by Adweek Magazine as one of the five most influential broadcast journalists in the field of technology. He's written for publications such as Windows Magazine, PC Magazine, Silicon Valley Magazine, The Prize Magazine, and Digital Video Magazine. And he also published the Chappé Newsletter, which was a monthly newsletter for personal computer users. He was a graduate of USC with a degree in mathematics and psychology. He also holds a doctorate in law from Harvard and was a Benton Fellow in Technology Journalism at the University of Chicago. Stewart will talk about his early experiences with Radio Shack computers. He'll talk about Computer Chronicles, of course, and an update on what he's done since the show. We're very honored to have all of you to come to our show, which celebrates the contributions that Tandy Radio Shack made to the computer and technology field, and I'm very honored to have Stuart Chaffee here to help us kick it off. Thank you very much, Randy. Can you guys hear? Yep. We have a Mickey Mouse audio system here. <laughs> we couldn't figure out how to get audio out of the laptop, so we've got a mic next to the speaker. <laughs> That's cool. And we heard it only the last couple of seconds of what was the opening theme to Computer Chronicles. But 
I'm going to start with actually playing a clip of a show we did, which many of you may have seen. It was devoted completely to Tandy and Radio Shack Computer, done back in 1991, so over 25 years ago. So let's take a look at this. And when your radio broke down, you would take one of these out of the back, take it down to a store like this called a Radio Shack, test it, buy it, and probably buy some other electronic junk while you were here. It's just likely to walk out of a Radio Shack store carrying computer software or a brand new 386 PC. So from the Model 1 to the Model 100, from the color computer to the new multimedia PCs, Tandy Radio Shack has played a significant role in the growth of personal computers. Today, we take a look at Tandy computers then and now on the special edition of the Computer Chronicles. <coughs> so again, this was a show from 1991, and I was a big Tandy fan, so were a lot of the people who worked on the show. So we decided, why not do a whole half hour just on Tandy computers? Computer Chronicles has made possible in part So we had sponsors called Underwriters in the public television world, and at that time they kept on changing. These are just some of the ads we ran prior to the beginning. So I'm going to run just the first couple of seconds of the actual show itself. $200 extra 
to upgrade it to 16 gig, and here he is. Multimedia in the 70s. Well, a lot of people used to make fun of the TRS-80, call it the trash 80 and so on, but the fact of the matter is that over the years, Tandy has been pretty innovative. They virtually invented the laptop market with the Model 100. They were the first to come up with a friendly user interface, bundle, integrated software, desk mate. In fact, they've done quite a few interesting things. And today, we're going to look at some of the great Tandy Radio Shack history, and we'll see the newest multimedia product from Tandy, new company, Grid. Now, if there is any dedicated group of old computer users, it is certainly the people who still love their Coco, the Tandy <laughs> Color Computer. Let me start with a visit to the Color Computer Users Group, Santa Clara, California. Now, the Radio Shack Color... Uh, we don't have time for all of that. If you want to see the whole show, it's online. It's called Tandy slash Radio Shack. <laughs> so, let's move ahead. You guys hear me okay, by the way? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. <coughs> so, what I want to do is talk a little bit really about Computer Chronicles, my experience playing with all these old computers for going back about 30 years ago, I guess, when we all started. And kind of answer some of the questions that people always <coughs> ask me about the Computer Chronicles show, how it got started, and so on. Uh, I want to mention the other show we did for six years called Net Cafe, which was a lot of fun, all focused on the internet. And I'll talk about some of the memorable moments I remember from doing Computer Chronicles in the studio. Uh, I'm going to talk about how we got Computer Chronicles online on the archive, the Internet Archive, which is an interesting story. Some of the interesting people I met during the time we did Computer Chronicles. People asking me about why is there no more Computer Chronicles, so I'll talk about the demise of the show, and just a little bit about what I'm up to now. So how did this all start? Well, it was a very selfish endeavor, actually. I was a geek. I just bought my Model 1 from TR City. And there was very little support available at the time. As you know, there were virtually there were two computer magazines, I think, at the time, very high end, not really for, for dumb users like me. And uh, I was looking at a way to get some more information <coughs> on how to use my computer and how to do cool things with it. Besides having my Tandy computer, I was basically a gadget geek at the time. I, and to this day, I still have, what, I have three Amiga computers, a bunch of PCs, a bunch of Apples, but I have a complete list of all the PDAs that ever came out. Uh, I was a big fan of techie watches, so I had a whole collection of watches that are uh, high tech. I had the original laptop, which most people may not remember, was the HP Portable, which I have and it still works. Uh, one of my prized possessions is the first optical encyclopedia that came out from Activision, and then Activenture, a Grolier's encyclopedia on a laser disc. <laughs> Didn't have enough room to fit it on all the CDs. Uh, I still have that, I'm very proud of it. My favorite floppy piece of antique stuff is the original five and a quarter inch Apple disc of Visicalc. <laughs> so a lot of great old stuff, and I love that old stuff. So the problem is, how did you get help in those early days to figure out what you were doing with all these computers? So the basic place you went to for help was a users group. So I went to a users group meeting in the Bay Area. I was working in the Silicon Valley area at the time. And I was fascinated by what happened at this users group meeting. I mean, there's really good, solid information that you really couldn't get anywhere else. And there are like 12 guys in some guy's garage. I said, this is such a waste of information. There should be thousands, tens of thousands of people being able to participate in this users group meeting, not just 12 guys in the garage. At the time, I was running a TV station, a PBS TV station in the Silicon Valley, and I thought, I want to make a TV show out of this. <clears throat> Let's televise these users group meetings so more people can benefit from it. And that's really how it got started. We started out with doing a, believe it or not, a live show <coughs> demonstrating new technology, which didn't work half the time. We are very brave, live show, Thursday nights, 8 to 9 in the Silicon Valley area. And it was hosted the first year, I didn't host it, I produced it. The host was Jim Warren, who had actually the first computer trade show, the West Coast Computer Fair. And basically, he'd come in the studio, invite his geek friends, and they would say, here's this new toy, here's this new thing I did. And I thought this was just sort of a community television, sort of a fun little thing we were doing. Some, for some reason, it took off. People started to discover there was this show called Computer Chronicles. Again, just local, very low production value, no budget, everybody worked for nothing. And somehow, it caught on. We decided, since it seemed so popular, that we would do something about it and try to make a better show with more production values and plan for a new show starting in the next season. Unfortunately, Jim Warren wasn't able to come on to the show because he was pretty busy doing other stuff. And he really wasn't that great, frankly, a television host. He was, he was great for the super geek community. <coughs> normal people couldn't really understand what he was talking about. 
So we said, let's try to not only build the show up, but make it a little bit more approachable for new users. And for some reason, the staff came to me and said, Stu, why don't you host it? Because I actually had been working as a reporter for the Nightly Business Report covering Silicon Valley. I had worked in, my background was ABC News and CBS News, so anyhow, I ended up saying yes to do it. Problem is, we had to find the money to do the show. Again, we couldn't afford it. If we were going to do a high quality show that has syndication possibilities, we couldn't do it uh, on a dime the way we were doing it before. So we started looking around, who, who could we find to sponsor this show? Well, there was this company down the road of it called Apple. And they just came out with the Apple II, and I thought, these guys are looking for customers, we're looking for a sponsor. So some of the people working with me contact some of the people at Apple and said, we have this great idea, why don't you sponsor this new show called Computer Chronicles? And we met with the staff at Apple, their marketing people, their advertising people, their PR people. They all thought it was a great idea. They said, we're going to recommend this to Steve. Steve Jobs, of course. Uh, and see if we can, you know, we'll go ahead. So they actually wrote a memo to Steve saying, we recommend that Apple sponsor this new show, Computer Chronicles. So I was invited to make a presentation to the Apple board meeting with Steve Chering <coughs> to give my final pitch as to why they should sponsor the show. Well, that was my first unpleasant experience with Steve Jobs. <laughs> <laughs> first of many. <laughs> so I was my turn on the agenda to make the presentation. I think I had four words come out of my mouth and interrupted me, which was his style. He said, let me ask you a question. I said, sure. Are you going to cover non-Apple products on your show? I said, sure. I said, it's a computer show. It's not an Apple show. You need a sponsor of the show. Well, why the hell should I give you money to promote my competitors? Oh, yeah. I said, well, when you, my guess is when you take an ad in a magazine or a newspaper, you don't tell the editorial side, they're not allowed to do anything except cover Apple products. As we signed the point. I think they wasted money. <laughs> so he sat there like this, and he doing this funny thing. I have a better way to spend that money. Let's spend it on, I got an idea, a Super Bowl commercial. That was the genesis of the famous 1980 Macintosh commercial in the Super Bowl. So I made the pitch, but CBS got the money. <laughs> a quarter million dollars. Anyhow, that was not a good experience. So we ran out of luck with Apple, and we decided to go somewhere else. But luckily, we found the complete opposite of Steve Jobs, a guy named Gary Kilgall. Total gentleman, yep. really cared about what we were doing, really cared about educating the public about personal computer technology. And we talked to Gary, and he said, why don't you come up, see me, we'll talk about this, see if we can help. Unfortunately, Digital Research, the company he was running, was 100 miles away from our studio, which is in San Mateo, California. Gary said, don't worry about it, I'm going to send my chopper down, we'll pick you guys up, we'll meet at the San Carlos Airport, we'll fly you over here, we'll have our meeting, we'll fly you back. Wow, what do you got this is? Complete opposite from my previous experience. Um, so he said, uh, our chopper pilot will meet you at 2 o'clock at the cafeteria at the San Carlos Airport. <clears throat> so a colleague of mine was standing there in the cafeteria at the San Carlos Airport. It's 10, 2 o'clock. Can't see any chopper pilot. We're looking, we're waiting. I guess we made a mistake, something's wrong here, so we called Gary's office. I said, I don't, I don't see the pilot. Where is he? It's a she. My first lesson in sexism. I assumed the chopper pilot was a guy. <laughs> and it was this very capable woman who was the chopper pilot who came up and said, I'm, you're, I'm, you're the guys I'm waiting for. Anyhow, they flew us out to see Gary. We had a meeting, and he couldn't have been nicer. He said, look, I can't afford to give you all the money. We're looking for a quarter million dollars. But I will give you some seed money to help you find the money. I'll give you 25000 bucks to help you find what you need to sponsor the show. And I saw when I met Gary how articulate he was and how smart he was and how nice he was. And he said, Gary, you know, I'm actually looking for a co-host for the show. I'm just a journalist, I'm not really a techie. You're the techie guy. If we could co-host this together, that would be a good combination. I'll do it. He was running a very big, successful company at the time called Digital Research. He agreed to build two full days a month to come, to come down to the Silicon Valley <coughs> and co-host the show with me. This is actually fun, because Gary, as you may know, was a pilot, so he would have to fly down. Gary also had all money. <coughs> he would drive down in his Lamborghini. Quarter million dollar Lamborghini. That was all for my show. He had a car. <laughs> Anyhow, he volunteered to do it, and what a great decision that was. And we started with, that. with the twenty-five thousand that Gary gave us. We actually were able to find a real sponsor. Our first sponsor of the show was a company called Microfocus, an English company that had just done an IPO, had a lot of cash sitting around. Nobody had ever heard of them in the United States, and their bit was uh, transcoding. 
COBOL programming for personal computer. Anyhow, I worked out, and so with the money, money we launched our new show, a half hour show, uh, <clears throat> and which much, with much better production value. Now this was again started as a local show. We knew nothing about syndicating the show. We were just following our passion. So there was no internet, no cell phones, there was nothing. It was bulletin boards. <coughs> And somehow these guys on their BBS have started talking to each other around the country. They even had a show in Silicon Valley that explains all this computer stuff. So the geeks started calling their local PBS station saying, why don't you carry the show? The manager of the station started calling me, saying, how can we get the show? Just by answering the phone, three months later we were on in 20 cities around the country. Hmm. This was viral before anybody had used the word viral. Oh, wow. It just took off totally on its own. We never tried to sell it. It sold yeah. itself. And again, at the end of one year, we were on about 100 cities. At the end of two years, 200 cities. At the end of three years, we had an international distribution. There was a French version, a Spanish version, an Arabic version. We were on in over 100 countries around the world with our little computer chronicle show that started out as a hobby. And then it just wouldn't die. For <laughs> 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 the years, I kept on doing the same show. <laughs> I mean, this was a job, you know. I mean, I had a full-time day job running a TV station. So this was really just a, a, a hobby of love for me. Never got paid anything to do computer chronicles, by the way. I just did it for fun. And unfortunately, about six or seven years later, Gary decided to move digital research from the Silicon Valley to Austin, Texas. Competition for talent at the time in the Valley was really tough. Prices were really hard for talent. Prices, the cost of living was really high. Yeah, and of course, the digital research was not the digital research that had been six years ago. Gary decided to move to Austin, where it would be less expensive to run his company. And so we lost Gary as a co-host. We've tried rotating co-hosts. I mean, I worked with different people, and it just turned out to be a mess. I had to keep on training people every other week about how to do the show. Finally, the staff came to me and said, why don't you just do it yourself? You know enough by now. So I said, okay, I'll do it myself. Can you imagine what fun, if you're a geek like I was, loving all the new toys, all the new stuff that came out, have a job where you got to see it before anybody else saw it. And it was really, really like to explain it to other people. I mean, this was not a job. This was just great fun. And matter of fact, there was a little anecdote I should share with you. We had, a, I think it was our first producer on the show, and we had trouble keeping people because the salaries were so high in Silicon Valley. We were a little nonprofit still. So she was being recruited by some uh, high-tech PR firm in the Valley. They were offering to double her salary. And the interviewer said to her, why would you consider leaving that show? What's so great about working on Computer Chronicle? She said, because every day is like Christmas morning. I come to the office and there are boxes at the front door with all these new gadgets, all these new toys, and we get to play with them, and we get to see them before anybody else does. And that was the story of why everybody was in love with the show, at least the people who worked on it. Let me move over a little bit to the Net Cafe show, which never was as popular as Computer Chronicles, but it was interesting, I had the same experience. <clears throat> so remember to start Chronicles, I went to this users group meeting, decided there should be more than 20 people watching this thing, let's make a television show. At that time, about mid-1990s, there were these things called cyber cafes, or internet cafes started. And one of the big ones originally was something called Cybersmith. They opened a big store in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and at Harvard. They opened a store in Palo Alto, near Stanford. And I used to hang out at the uh, cyber cafe in, at Stanford in Palo Alto. And this was the same experience I'd had all over again with Chronicles. This is great stuff. People are really explaining the new websites and how you do stuff and how you stream and so on and so forth. This ought to be a television show. And I said, let's do it. So the next year we started this new show called Net Cafe. Same idea, except it was different. Chronicles were shot in the studio. We decided to get the real Net Cafe experience, and we decided to shoot it in internet cafes all around. Basically, the Bay Area. We did some back east. And it was really. All the key guys were coming with new ideas, new internet, cool things. We would sit around and talk. This was not about technology, we didn't do demos, but we really talked about the people and the culture of this new thing called the internet. And I had great fun doing that show. Um, we got involved after you may be aware of the Webby Awards, which was sort of the Academy Awards and new websites. And I think for several years we produced a one hour special each year uh, covering the Webby Awards. There was one show in particular, I think it was the very first show. The, guess what, the award for best new search engine went to a company called Google. <laughs> well, Sergey and Larry, the two guys who founded Google, were there to accept the award. You may know these two guys are Russian, and they're big ice hockey fans. <coughs> they were prepared to win. 
and called him. The winners are Sergey Brin and Larry Page with Google. These guys rollerbladed down the aisle <laughs> with their hockey sticks. Somehow managed to climb up on the stage on their skate, rolled to the podium, gave, gave their acceptance speech on the moment. But uh, a pretty, pretty fun moment. Uh, while talking about the internet, I should mention one other thing, by the way, which most people don't know. The very first television program, full television program, half hour television program, to be streamed on the internet, was Computer Chronicles. And that was really Computer Chronicles. Back in, I think it was 1990, something called the M Bone at the time, developed by a guy in Washington, D.C. So we were really excited to actually put a TV show on the internet at that time. <coughs> I want to talk about things I remember about some of the shows we did. At the time, I was working with a dot matrix printer, and Xerox announced they'd come out with a color laser printer. Wow. Now, there were laser printers out at that time, but they were very expensive. Very few individual units could afford to use a laser printer. But these guys had a color laser printer, so we're going to put that on the show. And you're doing a show on printers and hard copies. So we invited Xerox to come into the studio and demonstrate the new color laser printer. The printer, I thought, was a little thing you put on your desk. And this thing was the size of a Volkswagen. <laughs> a big Volkswagen, not a people. <laughs> Came on two pallets, three engineers to install this thing, set it up, and get it working. And it took them for, I think, it, I don't know how long it took these guys to get this thing. And at some point, they finally said, okay, we're ready to try it. So everything was plugged in. Again, it was a monster thing, it took up half the studio. And they get it, this is a print button, I'm going to press the print button. They press the print button, smoke starts. Building <laughs> <laughs> great smoke. Okay, hold it, hold it, hold it. I think we made a mistake. I guess so. <laughs> Give us another half hour. <laughs> twiddle around, twiddle around, twiddle around. Say, okay, we're ready to try it again. <laughs> Presses the print button, and the most gorgeous piece of output I've ever seen in my life came out of this printer. There's a famous picture, you may have seen there's a picture of a baboon. Face of a baboon. Oh, yeah. Brilliant resolution, brilliant color, still have that out. And I said, wow, this is the feature of output. This is spectacular. So we finally made it through the disaster with Xerox and we came up with a really good demo. Another interesting, we used to do something at the beginning of most shows, what we call the toy tease. We played with something really simple to get across the idea of what we were talking about. So we were going to do a show on robots and robotics. And as we were researching the show, we found somebody who developed a ping pong robot, a robot that could play ping pong. Cool. I mean, it didn't play itself. It played a human player. It had a human on one side, a robot on the other side. So we were going to open the show with this robot ping pong player playing the game of ping pong. I said to Gary, look, I'm not a really good ping pong player. You're better than I am. Why don't you make a demo? Sure. So they wired the whole thing up. He said, let's give it a test before we actually roll tape. And he said, do you want Gary, do you want to serve, or do you want the robot to serve first? I said, let the robot serve first. He presses the button. The robot strives this missile right to Gary's crotch. What a brave Gary. I'll do it again, no problem. <laughs> we finally got it to work, but that was a very embarrassing moment. <laughs> Lots of embarrassing moments. I'll give you another one. So we were showing off a new IBM PS2. We had John Dvorak come in the studio and demonstrate the PS2. It was a modular computer. It was like a computer made out of a Lego set. So you didn't have to have soldering irons, you didn't have to pull wires anywhere, you just pull these Lego blocks out. He said, let me show you, this thing is so good, so simple, so modular, I can take it apart and put it back together right here. Without any tool. Let's do it. He pulls all the modules out and starts, I said, let's put it back together now, John. Puts that module in, puts that module in, he puts it, where did that go? Is that that slow? <laughs> <laughs> was that slow? Didn't work. Oh, I'll try it again, no problem, I know how to do this. So after about three or four goes, he finally figured out how to put these modules in the right place, and then it worked. Sweat was pouring down his forehead. <laughs> couldn't figure out how to get the damn thing down. This happens over and over again when you're doing a show on technology that's never been shown before. Then we had a software example. We had Peter Norton on the show, Peter Norton Utilities. <laughs> and his claim to fame was his original program called Unerase. And he astonished people by saying, you know, when you think you delete a file, you don't really delete it. You just and I'm going to show you how to bring back a file you thought you were deleting. So let me show you how to do it. So he took this file, and he said, I'm going to delete this file. Watch, delete, gone. Now I'm going to bring it back. Watch this. <laughs> Sweat pouring down his mouth. I can't find it. I know it's here somewhere. Believe me, I can do it. <laughs> Stop tape. Wait till he figures it in. <laughs> Pick it up again, and he was able to do it. You can't imagine how stressful it was to do these new demos at those days in a live on tape television show. And half the time it didn't work. There's a standard line from the guy from the computer company who was in the studio. 
work perfectly in my hotel room. <laughs> 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 doesn't matter. So, uh, one of the really interesting moments I found was not a moment, but something that was spoken by a guy from Microsoft. <coughs> we were doing a show on OS2 before. At the time, there was sort of a competition between Windows and PD and OS2 as to what was going to be the high end operating system in the future. And <coughs> there was supposedly a partnership between Microsoft and IBM developing OS2. As is Microsoft's style, under the table, they were threatening to kill OS2. But that was not the public position. Here's this guy from Microsoft on the show who said, well, Windows is a good solution, but it's not the permanent solution. The all long-term operating system solution is OS2. This is spoken by a guy from Microsoft. Very telling as to what goes on at the top and what goes on inside. Hmm. I was a big fan, and always have been, of course, the world was changed <coughs> dramatically on speech synthesis and speech recognition. So we did a show on speech synthesis and speech recognition. And the first real product that utilized this technology was a doll from Mattel, the talking doll that came out from Mattel. And with this doll, the kids would you know, press a button and say, Hello, Don, how are you? Don say, I'm fine, how are you? What's your name? My name is Don, whatever. So we went to a Toys R Us right before Christmas, and the entire aisle was filled with these new talking dolls from Hotel. All right, let's do the demo. So we're rolling paint, the camera is pushing us. Now watch how this cool this thing is. I press the try me, and I say to the doll, Hi, my name is Stuart, how are you? The doll says, Oh, I'm fine, how are you? Don Exor says, I'm fine, how are you? <laughs> Don Exor says, I'm fine, how are you? Oh, a hundred dollars start talking. <laughs> <laughs> Never thought of this problem. <laughs> <laughs> Very proud of the fact that we not only cover technology in this country, but we went around the world. I think we shot maybe a dozen different countries. Uh, I think we're in France, Spain, Hong Kong, Israel, Germany. Monaco, Austria, Italy, Taiwan, Japan, Hungary, Czech Republic, and China. Let me tell you about the story of trying to shoot in China. So when we travel to another country to do a show, we bring all our gear. And at the time, it was a separate videotape recorder. It wasn't built in the camera, in a separate camera. And we would come with our box of blank videotapes. If we were shooting on three-quarter inch matic video cassettes at the time. It's a box of about 30 cassettes, I think, to do, I think to do the show. So we're going through customs at the Beijing airport. You guys says, what's in that box? I said, blank videotapes. What do you mean blank videotapes? I said, well, they've never been used. You see, the box has never been opened. What's on the tape? I said, nothing. I've got to see the tape. I said, we never use them. I've got to see the tapes to make sure there's no pornography, there's no anti-communist propaganda on there. <clears throat> For four hours, this guy <laughs> stared at the blank screen. <laughs> <laughs> used up all our batteries. <laughs> When we actually went to go to work, we had to spend the entire night charging all the batteries again. Four hours of staring at a blank screen. We'll never forget that one. <laughs> Very proud of a show we did back in 1991, 25 plus years ago, when nobody ever heard the term on virtual reality. <coughs> this was a difficult show to do. Again, very new cutting edge technology. So we did a VR show. We had a lot of fun doing the computer ball shows. I don't know if you ever saw those, and we would actually produce a quiz show between Geeks from the West Coast, geeks from the East Coast, who knew the most about the trivia. And number one, it got me to see how viciously competitive these guys are. <laughs> Especially Bill Gates, by the way. He, he would not, anything that, anytime he didn't win, it was unfair. <laughs> Anyhow, so we worked with, uh, I worked with Gates several times, Andy Grove, Mitch Caper, Andy Kirkfield, Ed Jude, Jude Candy was there, Martin Anderson, Bill Joy, Jean Louis Gasset, uh, John Dorf, I forgot. All the guys, it was great fun doing that show. <coughs> These really super smart guys who were viciously competitive. They did not like to lose. Big surprise, they were running the companies. Let me talk a little about that. Before, as I finish talking about show, let me ask you what you think is the most popular show we ever did in terms of the amount of downloads from the archive. Hmm. What was the subject you think? The Commodore 64. Oh. <laughs> this is a loyal group of guys. The most popular show has been downloaded, downloaded, not viewed. Downloaded over a quarter million times just from the archive. Wow. Let alone what's on YouTube. <laughs> Who would think it's Commodore 64 guys? They're as dedicated to that C64 as you are to the Tandy. Let me talk about how we got these shows all online, actually, because that's a pretty interesting story, yeah. also. So, by the mid 1990s, I guess, we had hundreds of shows on videotape sitting on the shelf. Keep in mind, over the years, the videotape formats kept on changing. So you got three quarter inch, and one inch, and two inch, blah, blah, blah. <coughs> and I still have all these tapes lined up, all these different formats, which most of which you can't even play anymore. 
So it so happens on the Net Cafe show we were doing, I was interviewing Mr. Kale, who started the Internet Archive. And the Internet Archive started out as really an archive of web pages. Bruce had a very clever idea of you do research, you can go to the library and look up an old magazine, you can go to the library and look up an old newspaper, but you can't go to the library and look up an old web page. They disappear. So Bruce decided, let's start a library of web pages so people can go back and research this. And we started a thing called the Wayback Machine. In the Wayback Machine, you can actually put in a URL, uh, yahoo.com, 1987, and you can start on one of the websites. It was really a brilliant idea. But the archive at the time was focused on text, because that's pretty much what the internet was at that time. All of a sudden, there's a lot of audio and video now on your website, and you weren't prepared to handle that. So I saw what his problem was, and I said, let me tell you about my problem. I've got hundreds of television shows all about the video history of the personal computer revolution. They're sitting on a shelf, inaccessible. Why don't we build a video collection in the Internet Archive of all our shows, digitize them, and make them freely accessible to anybody? He said, are you nuts? Give them away. I said, yeah, it's what Gary would have wanted us to do. And so we started a two-year project, mostly run by volunteers, to digitize all these tapes in all these different formats. You remember what a nightmare was to find machines to run these tapes. And we built up this entire library and put, decided to put them online for free, downloadable for free, no advertising, no sponsors, no belonging, no registration, no subscribing. And that was a big move for us. I mean, this is a couple million dollars worth of intellectual property. But really, in honor of Gary, we said, this is the whole point in the show, let's people have access to it. Now, we put those shows on under a Creative Commons license, which had restrictions on it. You could use it for non commercial purposes only. We trusted community, falsely. People started stealing this stuff left and right. To this day, everything on YouTube is pirated. We have never created a YouTube site. It's all stolen stuff, we put ads around it. I tried to fight it for a while, I took the it was a losing battle. What the hell? We want people to watch it and watch it on YouTube. So it's been a very frustrating experience. This ended up being a great online searchable database with the video of the PC revolution. And what really fascinates me, and more people have watched the show online now than ever watched on television, I get an email every day at least from two types of people. Older guys, 65 year old guys, say, oh, I remember the good old days. It's such fun watching those old shows. But better than that, I get emails from 15 year olds. This is so cool. I had no idea what the history of all this stuff was. So it really is, the life just continues to go on. People discover this stuff. Let me talk a little bit about the. Uh, People we dealt with in the good time. <coughs> and the first guy I have to talk about again is Gary Kilwall. You may know his story, very, very sad story. Poor Gary died at age 52. <coughs> very sad ending to his life. He just could never get over the fact that he got screwed by Bill Gates. It drove him crazy. Mm. As Bill Gates became a hero, nobody's ever heard of Gary Kilwall. Most people never even heard of Gary Kilwall. He really invented the personal computer business with this lithium operator. He just could never get used to that. He, his life really fell apart. He started drinking, drugs, <coughs> lost his wife, gained weight. Believe it or not, Gary, the most gentle man you can imagine, was in a biker bar in Pacific Grove, was drunk probably, got into an argument with some guy, swung at him, knocked him down on the ground. It's tough to tell the story. Hit his head on the concrete, he died three days, three days later of concussion. Incredible, incredibly sad story. Such a good man, such a good man. <clears throat> Let's talk about the IBM MS-DOS CPM battle. As many you know, there's a great Ms. Gary went flying into the IBM King calling. To some degree that's true, but let me tell you what Gary told me about that day. And there's lots of aspects of it. <coughs> but I was sitting with Gary one day, I said, come, tell me the truth, what really happened when you didn't get an IBM meeting? This told so much about who Gary was. He said, you know, they wanted to come on a Saturday. That was my wife's birthday. I had promised my wife I would take her flying. In. And I wasn't going to cancel that for some damn on the meeting. And this is the kind of guy I was. His loyalty to his wife was more important than a billion dollars to <coughs> IBM. There's, again, there's many other aspects of the story. But this is the kind Gary was not a businessman. Gary was not one of these viciously competitive guys. He was a brain guy. He was an innovator, developer, coder. And that was an example of it. I think you know the story of what eventually happened with IBM and CPM and MS DOS. Gary was certainly not a businessman, and that was one of his great weaknesses. Great technology guy, but not a businessman. They eventually made a deal with IBM 
And it was a compromise. I began to say, look, when we come out with our computer, we'll put CPM on there, but we also want to put MS-DOS on there. And let the market decide which one is the best. Gary said, no problem, we're going to win that battle. What Gary didn't know, which was in the contract, was that IBM was going to charge $240 for CPM and $40 for MS-DOS. Mm -hmm. Guess who won? <laughs> Six to one price difference. Gary got screwed, never got over that. I might say Bill Gates is certainly a tough, hard-nosed businessman, but I just spent some time with Bill over the years, and I'm not like most guys, I don't think he's a jerk. Steve Jobs, jerk. Bill Gates, not a jerk. Uh, a really smart guy, no question about it. A tough business guy, no question about it. Absolutely wants to win. But a decent guy, a smart guy, a cooperative guy, uh, always got along well with him. Uh, to everybody's surprise, I've never been a guy to bad mouth Gates, except, yeah, they sort of screwed Gary, but that was one of the mistakes on both sides in that negotiation. Bill Gates told me two brilliant things, not to do with technology, but to do with managing a large company. Remember at the time, Microsoft owned the world. I mean, computers around the world, software, and Microsoft operating system, the application of Microsoft Office Suite, et cetera. So I said to him, what are some of your basic rules of how you manage a monster company like this? He said, well, I have one basic rule. So I got tired of all the managers coming into me for a meeting and telling me how great everything was. Everything is great, there's no problem. Everything is great. <clears throat> and he said, this can't be the case. I made a rule. Every time somebody comes to me in a meeting and says, I'm give me a piece of good news, you must give me a piece of bad news. That was a brilliant piece of money. Tell me what's bad. Don't just tell me what's good. Because what's bad needs my help. What's good doesn't need my help. What a creative mind to think about that with your mind. The other thing that amazed me with Gary, with uh, Bill, at <coughs> the time, again, remember, this was a Microsoft world in, in the early 90s. Windows had taken off, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, uh, you know, what, do you th what do you worry about? I wake up every morning worrying about what I didn't think of. Where are we vulnerable? Who's going to take us on? And of course, what he hadn't thought about was networking. But he was smart enough to know he didn't know. And I just was very impressed with Bill and the guy. And look what he did with his life. He gave up the whole tech business and spent his billions of dollars screwing health problems around the world. He was really a good guy. We had George Morrow filled in, actually, after Gary left the show as a co-host for a while. George was a really bright guy, a very clever guy. He came out, and you may remember, the pivot one. First luggable, actually, it was smaller than the Osborne of the Compact, but it was a luggable portable computer. And this is interesting for people who went to floppy disks. George was on the show, actually, as a, as a provider, and he showed me the Pebble one and used five and a quarter inch floppy disk. Apple had just come out with three and a half inch disks. George very proudly said, Everybody's stuff is on five and a quarter. <laughs> who wants to buy a computer that doesn't show five and a quarter? Like five and a quarter. He, he was wrong, but it went out of business. But <laughs> <laughs> it was a way of thinking, and he hadn't quite caught up with the world. Uh, dealt a little bit with Michael Dell, totally in the Steve Jobs category. <clears throat> Did not like him. Let me tell you another Steve Jobs story. So there's some years later when the Lisa computer was coming out. You remember the Lisa? And there was a big event, I think, with the Anza College Auditorium in the Bay Area which they're going to announce the Lisa. And Steve did his usual flashy demonstration, showed him the Lisa, blah, blah, blah. After the demonstration was over, they invited the journalists to come up on the stage and do the one-on-ones with Steve. But what everybody was talking about in Silicon Valley is why is it they have to call it Lisa? And the word was, Lisa was the name of the illegitimate daughter. We never admitted to paternity. I thought it was pretty damn interesting. Everybody was talking about it. So everybody else is talking about the specs on Lisa, and I came home and said, Steve, you've got to ask a question that everybody's asking me. What's the story on why this is called the Lisa? That's not an appropriate question. Whoa. A lot of people are asking that. Get out and expect the test accident. Security, get this guy out of here. Whoa. This kind of guy, Steve Johnson, really obnoxious punk. <laughs> Clever, brilliant, but not a nice man. Apple, let me say a word about Apple. They're obviously a great <coughs> They want to do wonderful products, great marketing, great design, et cetera, et cetera. But they are not a customer-friendly company. Let me tell you my experience. Maybe some of you have the same experience. So I logged on one day to my computer, and it said, oh, why don't you upgrade from Yosemite to High Sierra? Much better experience. Yeah, sure, why not? Click, all of a 
of a sudden, Yosemite was gone and I had an ice computer. What they didn't tell me is about $1,000 worth of software I have written for cable. Yeah. All my video software is mm -hmm. dead. Won't play under ice computer. Apple stole $1,000 worth of software from me, <laughs> rudely, without even warning me, this is what's going to happen if I upgrade. That was disgraceful behavior. This is not a company that cares about its customers. Mm -hmm. I was furious about that. Anyhow, that's Jobs. Mm -hmm. And Apple. Uh, talked with Sergey Grin several times, really nice guy, bright guy, very impressed with the early days of Google. When Google was a startup working out of, I forget this woman's name, living <coughs> in, they were a really good company. They didn't need a motto, do no evil, they weren't doing any evil. Always worried about a company needing the motto, do no evil, you think that comes with the territory. <laughs> but no, when Google went public and there were billions of dollars on the table, that company changed dramatically. It was money, 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 not let's make a better life for people. Um, very disappointing what happened with Google. Of course, they changed their motto, but not do no evil, to do the right thing. It's a little bit more accessible, I think. We had Steve Case on the show, a really nice guy, the guy who started AOL and before that Quantum Leap. Um, good man, Steve Wozniak, he's in the Gary category, absolute gem of a man. Adam Osborne was a guy I really respected. I don't know many people remember Adam Osborne, but that was one of the first luggable computers <coughs> in the city, Osborne won. Um, he couldn't compete with Compaq when they came out with a similar machine. He then moved over to software and started selling out low-cost software really clones of things like Lotus 1, 2, 3. He got sued by Lotus, got put out of business. He died a very sad life a couple years after that. We had Jerry Yang on the show talking about when Yahoo first came out, good man. Most interesting odd couple I've ever seen in the tech business was Jack Tremino and Gary Kilgore. Complete opposites. Gary was a in, 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 an inner thought kind of guy, techie guy. Jack Tramiel used to be, a, I think it was a sewing machine salesman. <laughs> he just knew retail and selling boxes. Gary had nothing about that. He knew nothing about technology. I don't think he'd ever been to the Silicon Valley. And somehow these two guys got together with the new division of AccuVenture and then AccuVision. And actually Gary worked with Jack to do some of his multimedia products that came out of his company. A uh, really odd combination. Um, let me tell you one other interesting story. So we had many CEOs on the show would come into the studio to demonstrate their products. And, what I, and we wanted to get the top guy in the company, not some PR guy, so we often fought to get the CEO. What happened almost every single time is the CEO would come in and he didn't know anything about the product. <coughs> he didn't know how to use it. Classic scene was, there's the CEO on the set, ready to do things. He said, well, look, I was under this here. F2, press F2. <laughs> <laughs> all these CEOs, we're going to make the world a better place, we're going to make life easier for human beings, blah, 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 which was a Stepford Wife line. Underneath, we're going to make a million dollars fast. The competitive culture in Silicon Valley was vicious, glossed over by this, oh, we're going to change the world and do good things for people and so on and so forth. It was a really tough time to accept some of this. Let me talk about why there is no more computer chronicles. So this was 2002, and you remember that was a dot-com bust. So for several years in the dot-com boom, money was just pouring into the Silicon Valley for stupid ideas that had no chance of ever making a profit. And people got burned and a lot of money was lost. It was hard to raise money in the Valley at that time. So one problem was the dot-com bust and people losing faith in new technology. Second thing is the computer business had changed radically over 20 years. Our ace in the hole was we said to sponsors, everybody who watches our show is a customer. You're looking to be told, what's cool, what should I buy? 20 years later, everybody had a personal computer. So the game we were playing, introducing people to this whole idea, wasn't the same anymore. Matter of fact, I had an interesting conversation. I don't remember his name. The guy at the time was the editor of Macworld Magazine. He said, Stu, he said, when computers become like refrigerators, you just open them and close them, or close out of business. And he was right. People didn't need as much the kind of stuff we were doing. The other thing that happened was, quite frankly, it was a very dull period starting in the early 2000s. Uh, Microsoft kind of owned the software world. IBM at the time sort of owned the hardware world. Startups had been just put out of business by these two big monsters. And it really wasn't as interesting as it had been before. We were having a little bit of a struggle coming up with really cool new stuff. <coughs> so there was a lull in innovation. There were lots of mergers and acquisitions, which 
made things less competitive. And frankly, I've been doing this over 20 years, 52 weeks a year, and I was tired. I needed a break. So let's rethink this. Let's pull show off the air for a while. It's so hard to raise the money. It was so hard to do what we've done before. And I had a day job still. I was on TV station. Um, so we decided to pull it off and see what happens. And not much happened. Uh, let me tell you what happened next. So after taking down Chronicles, I was actually pretty impressed with what we had done with Internet Archive and digitizing all our Chronicles shows. That was a major move at the time. Very important for the Archive, certainly for us. And actually, Bruce McHale called me when he heard I wasn't doing the show anymore. He said, what you did with us working through the Chronicles, could you do the same thing and manage our getting other video collections like yours? Because what you did was so successful. I said, sounds like a great challenge. So I actually went to work with the nonprofit Internet Archive for a couple of years, helping them build their collection from again, text, to audio, and video. And now it's on a gigantic collection of God knows how many petabytes. <coughs> Let me tell you one really two sad stories about my work in the Internet Archive. We had started something in the archive called terrible name, open <coughs> source video. <laughs> totally geeky, lousy user interface, terrible front end. But the idea was brilliant. By now, bandwidth had become less expensive, storage was less expensive. We said, we will host your videos, whatever they are, upload them, and we'll carry them for you. Brilliant idea. And it was very successful. It was too successful. In the context we were in, in this nonprofit, I, I get, kept going to our management team saying, we've got to do something high of this idea of hosting for free, user-generated videos. You know, so, how are you going to make money showing videos of cats playing the piano? <laughs> trust me, I said. <laughs> they didn't trust me. Um, what happened next was very sad. So they didn't want to invest any money in making open source video better. A couple other guys did have the idea of stealing our <coughs> idea and making it better, and they started something called YouTube. Yeah. San Mateo, California, right down the street from us. In fact, when they were about to start YouTube, the guys from YouTube called me and said, look, we've got the great user interface, we've got the great platform, we've got the open the front end. You've got the content. We don't have any content. Can we work together? Use your content. Use our front end. Great idea. That next time I'm in. So what happened next? A couple of months later, YouTube launched. <laughs> the biggest thing that's ever happened. A couple of months later, they sold YouTube to Google for $1.6 billion. Oh, we really blew it. <laughs> People wouldn't believe it. Anyhow, the next really interesting experience I had in Internet Archive <coughs> was a similar problem to what I had to Chronicles. Turns out, I found out that NASA was really interested in doing what we had done by putting, creating a website that was all video. NASA owned, as I owned the history of the personal computer revolution, NASA owned the video of the American Space Program, 50 years worth. As my problem, they had tapes sitting on shelves, in some cases film sitting on shelves, rotting away. Nobody had access to this valuable stuff. Finally, they woke <coughs> up at NASA one day and said, we've got to solve this problem. So they put out an RFP, a request for proposal, to somebody to come along and say, can you build a website for us that will archive all our videos for people to <coughs> Well, I was crazy enough to bid on this. I actually wrote the proposal up against lots of big companies. We were a small nonprofit. And believe it or not, NASA picked us to do this. So we were doing exactly the same thing. We'd done the same thing before. So excited. I mean, worked up, I think a year or two I spent working with NASA, the smartest people I'd ever come across, the nicest people I'd ever come across. So we made the deal with NASA, but as what happened with the YouTube disaster, I could not convince management of the archive that this is worth investing in. We, NASA had never picked an outside vendor to do something like this before. We were the first ones. I couldn't figure out how they were going to make money on this. <clears throat> and I was not able to deliver on the promises I had made to NASA about how we were going to do this. And so they basically pulled the plug on it, and I quit Internet Archive at the time because I was just too embarrassed that I had made promises I couldn't keep. But I had a second play in mind. NASA archives are supposed to focus exclusively on NASA content. I said, let's go beyond that. That's not the only space program in the world. There's the Russian space program, there's the Japanese program, there's the European space program. So I went to work with a company in Boston called Image Fortress, which is doing things very similar to what we were doing. And I said, let's build a site called the International Space Archive. This is a for-profit company. Great idea, great fun. I had never known what the pressures of a startup were. The pressure for me to bring money in, to do things that I didn't think were ethical to do, just to bring money in, I, I wasn't comfortable doing it. So I quit that too because 
my reputation was worth more than what I was going to have in the company. So that was a sad story also. Actually being so frustrated with my experience with for-profit startup, I totally dropped out and went to academia and became a professor of broadcast journalism at the University of Nevada's Reynolds School of Journalism, which was great fun. And that's really basically since then, I did that for a couple of years, but I couldn't afford to really do it much longer. The pay was terrible for university professors, mm -hmm. or at my level, anyhow. So since then, I've been doing freelance production, a little bit in the tech field, but really I've been very interested in technology in the healthcare field, and some personal experiences myself, which got me interested in that. Uh, and sort of broadened out all over the place. I did a special for PBS on the great movie Piano. I did a five-part special for the Fox Business Network on Palm Oil, which is a long story I don't have time to get into. People are always telling me, why don't you relaunch Commuter Chronicle? You just have to accept the fact that the world has changed. I mean, every guy with an iPhone in a basement can do some version of Commuter Chronicle these days. I just didn't want to go through it all. And our show was an expensive show to do. It cost us a million dollars to do the that show. And I did sit down with stomach to run around with my hand out saying, I need a million bucks, I'd like to do the show again. The world had changed too much. So every, every week, it's a new thing. Oh, I was only doing a show this week. I'd love to cover that Sunday. So I didn't get to do that. I just want to get, get tired of fighting the, the money battle. Um, so I'm back to being a tech geek, consumer, um, very interested in things like virtual reality, artificial intelligence, self-driving cars, um, the Internet of Things, what's happening with mobile, and voice fascinates me. I've gotten to things like Alexa and Google Assistant and Siri and Android. I mean, we did shows on speech for years. They never worked until about two years ago. <laughs> Uh, I'm really focused on privacy issues on the web. I'm really upset with what's going on in which people like Facebook are making money on material that I give for nothing. What a great business to be in. Their supply costs are zero. You can basically charge people for using that content. I'm just upset with commercialization of the web, as many early web founders are. It drives me nuts when I click on seeing something, I can't see it. I've got to watch something in 30 seconds. Commercial, yeah. yeah. It drives me nuts. So my current passion idea is to start something I call the PBS of the internet. A quiet, peaceful, non-commercial place where you can surf the web, do what you want to do, and get out of there without being bombarded ad after ad after ad. I don't know where that will take off, but that's what I'm trying to do. Even though we put all the uh, archive stuff, the computer chronicle shows and Netcat Face shows online, they actually are all copyrighted. And we still are in the business of licensing that content. We worked with CNN for a couple of years. We did a tech show on tech in the 80s, tech in the 90s. They licensed a lot of our material. Every day I get calls from people around the world who are doing documentaries or feature films looking for this video, which basically nobody else has. So we do a little bit of that. I actually worked on an interesting project, especially for me, the Steve Jobs Opera, which premiered about a year ago at the Santa Fe Opera. And I spent a lot of time researching Jobs and Apple at the time after they died, of course. And uh, I learned a lot, but I didn't know about Apple and about Steve. It didn't change my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> but it was really interesting. I mean, Jobs was such an interesting character. Apple was such a, for a while, screwed up company, uh, which obviously came back from the dead. I mean, it was almost out of business at some point. It was really interesting working on that. I actually put together a computer conference around the premiere of the opera talking about Apple and Steve Jobs. I actually wrote a book called Darwin's Dilemma. I've always been fascinated by interspecies communication. And I've done some research with Coco the Gorilla, who did sign language, and wrote a book about that, which I'm still trying to get published. I've talked to some of you about, everybody's asking me, why don't you do a book about the inside story of Computer Chronicles? <coughs> the good news is, I have all the notes, all the documentation from every show we ever did. The bad news is, it's going to take hundreds of hours of work <laughs> to turn this into a book. Trying to get going in that, it's kind of difficult. My passion at the moment is Gary Gilmore and the play with Donald Dunn. I mean, this story has to be told. It's such a great story. It's a sad story, a meaningful story. It's got so many messages in there. We've got the play finished. We're ready to go. We decided not to do it as a play because it's really hard to raise money for something that vanishes after a couple of weeks. So we're working now on getting money to do either a feature film or a TV special. It's called The Forgotten Computer Genius. Might be a title. And that's what I'm trying to get done right now. In terms of communicating and publishing and journalism, basically it's my Twitter account. I tweet every now and then with weird tech stories, and that is my continuing attempt to say something of value to people. That's about it, so thank you very much for your attention. I hope you found it interesting. Brian Fillage, you'll see that radio. No.
it, well, not really. I mean, that's a long story. When we were putting together the Chronicles in our company, at the same time CNN was putting together their company, we in fact met with CNN, I mean, with YouTube, uh, trying to work out a deal together. They were tough to deal with, or never happened. So we dealt with that. the main guys at CNN. They were obviously a great job, a brilliant job for the CNN. Today. <laughs> we ended up not being part of that. I had to emulate, emulate a Mac on my meeting so I could listen to it. Because <laughs> <laughs> if you have real audio, I need to be good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, anybody else have any questions? Okay. Yes, go ahead. Did you ever uh, read Fire in the Valley? Yep. You, how, did, how did that go? Uh, I've read so many books that I have to remember actually what was in that one. Um, tell me. I don't really remember. Oh, it was, it was just a big, long thing. Yeah. Right. Right, right, right. I mean, it's been so much written about the Valley. A lot of the sort of PR oriented, uh, a lot of the sort of dink and dirt oriented. Uh, I, I, I'm certainly not up to speed on all the stuff. Do you have a, 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 that kind of a book that you recommend about the history of? That's a really good question. No, I don't. I have to think about that. I'm sorry. Write one. Uh, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> all I need is time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, uh, not just a bit of it. I didn't really see all of it. I'm sorry. I was trying to, in fact, to sort of pull myself out of this whole tech thing for a while. <laughs> so I was sort of buried in it for 20 years, and so I expanded to healthcare and other things that I could take a fresh mind to. Yes? What do you think of the uh, new Apple Watch and its heart monitor? As much as I hate Apple, question. I love Apple. <laughs> I like it a lot. I'm a big Apple Watch fan. This is actually the original, it's not the new one. I'm going to get the new one soon. Uh, a lot of people think it's a waste of time, a waste of money. I think it's pretty cool. I think what you can do on your wrist without grabbing things out of your pocket uh, is very impressive. It's the best watch I've seen that does all this stuff. Uh, I started out with other ones before Apple came out with the Apple Watch. Uh, it doesn't bother me about all this hard money. I think the health stuff is really a good step in the right direction. There's so much of your information being stolen and used right now. That's the least of my problems, and you know what my heart rate is. It just cracks me up when I see that watch. I think of Sam Dool and Dick Tracy. And yep. <laughs> yep. Yep. Same thing. Same thing. No, I think it's a very, very cool tool. They did a really good job with it. And again, I resisted for a while because they didn't want to resist anything out there until I give in. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's really the best one out there. Yes. Uh, what's your favorite episode of the Barber that you did? Oh, boy, that's a tough one. Probably the very first one we ever did. Because I was so proud that we actually pulled this off. Nobody thought we could ever do this. It was called From Mainframes to Minis to Micros. We actually went out to MIT and looked at what they were doing with mainframe computers and some incredible stuff. And just the fact that we pulled this off and did a show, I was able to pull it off. At the time, I think, I don't think Gary had coast yet. I think it was using Herb Lechner from SRI, I think was the co host of that first show. That was a really brilliant guy. We had actually gone to SRI. <clears throat> that didn't work out, but they're very big friends of the show. Uh, just the fact that we pulled it off and did the show. That we had some, in the early days, interesting times because we finally migrated to having more sort of product company oriented people. When the show started, we had a lot of academics. But the very first season, not too long after we did that mainframe to Micros and Minis show, we did a show on artificial intelligence way back 30 years ago. And we had Ed Feigenbaum, professor of artificial intelligence at Stanford on the show. Ed was used to lecturing for 15 minutes. He didn't realize this was a TV show. <laughs> we started out and asked him one question. <laughs> 45 minutes later, he's still talking. <laughs> and Ed, I can't do this. So that's certainly not my favorite show, one of my least favorites. <laughs> yeah. In your watch collection, do you have any of the early talking watches? I do. I have a box full of these watches. I mean, every gadget you could. I have the first MP3 watch. First video watch. I mean, I got them on. I was just fascinated by how you could squeeze that technology mm -hmm. onto your wrist. And uh, yeah, I, I bought every one I could find. But it's pretty much done. Yeah. Yes. What are your thoughts on uh, why Sandy Radio Shack lost the lead in the first place? Well, that's a complicated question. I think it's a couple of things. They got stuck selling in stores where people didn't know what they were talking about. Mm -hmm. That was certainly my experience when I went shopping. Um, they really weren't, whether the Silicon Valley company, I don't think they were really in tune with the culture of what was happening at the time. 
It was not that well a managed company, and it was really a retail store that was trying to become a computer company. It just made a lot of mistakes, and they were they outplayed by the bigger players, uh, which is a shame. I mean, obviously, if you talk about it, it's a very limited thing. Um, and it was sad. I mean, I have told somebody before, I mean, I still drive by the original Radio Shack store I went to when I bought my Model 1. And it's sad, and it's now a GPS store. So it's not so good. Yeah. Following on to that, I mean, do you think Tandy's do you think Tandy's margins played a big difference in it? I mean, it seems like they really got squeezed and, and they couldn't make what they were used to making anymore. Exactly. They were used to selling little gadgets with big margins and in the competitive world they couldn't get away with that with the computers. I think it was absolutely a factor. And they just they didn't run the business well. I mean they had some cool technology, obviously, but uh, they weren't prepared to fight the big guys. Especially the older guys who weren't prepared for them. Even things like uh, what were they called? <coughs> It was a big change for a while. Oh, computer Land. Computer Land. Land. Yeah. Okay, thank you all again very much. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, unfortunately, Stuart, you're only going to be able to be around with us till about noon, so. Uh, Stop by and say hi before it gets off here. Uh, the next speak, speaker will be Arthur Gleckler on one kid's weird journey into software, and that's at one o'clock.